All right, go ahead, Matt. Great. Well, welcome everybody to our 2021 virtual version of our division awards. Um, some of you were able to attend in person in, in Boston um, last week, but uh, but most importantly, Claire was not able to attend. And so um, we uh, set this up to give her an opportunity to, to give her talk as well as just also give everybody an opportunity to again, see who, who our other award winners are. So I'm Matt Bassett, I'm with Corteva AgriScience. I am currently the second vice chair of the CAS division. Um, soon to be the first vice chair come January. Um, so um, there's, there, if you wanna clap virtually, go right ahead, but I'm gonna go through these awards and I'll, uh, um, and if you're, if, you, if, if you're one of the winners and you're online, maybe you could go on video and just, just uh, uh, wave your hand or something so people, people know who you are. Um, so let's see, is it gonna forward for me? There it goes. Um, so the, the first thing is, is that there's, um, as part of the student um, conference, there is a undergraduate poster presentation that we that we judge, and so the we had three winners that we selected for 2021, um, and here they are: um, Kareem Abdel Musad, Nicholas Snyder, and Shining Wang. And I don't know if any of them are on the line, but um, congratulations to them. Hopefully, they will continue their work into graduate school as well. Then the next award is for um, the oral presentation at the conference. And this is actually for the 2020 conference. Um, we bring them into the banquet to, so that they can get a, a plaque. And so last year's winner was Sung Ho Shin from the University of Wisconsin. And then for this year, we had, we always have, well not always, we, we have eight finalists who gave presentations um, during one of the sessions, so an, an invited session at the conference. Um, I won't read all their names, but you can see all the names of everybody. Um, all of those, except for two, were actually able to attend the, the in-person conference or, or banquet. And so, um, from those, we, we picked three winners. And so in third place was, was Con Lee from Carnegie Mellon. And then in second place, we had William Bradley from Georgia Tech. And then in first place was Daniel Lakey from Purdue University. So congratulations to all three of them. And then this is for um, graduate student and industrial poster presentation. So not part of the undergraduate conference. So this is the poster presentation that we have um, that's during the main um, conference. And, and of the, I think they were, you know, on the order of 50 posters that were, were presented. Um, we, we picked two actually for first place. And actually this was, I guess, I'm sorry, this was from last year. This is the 2020. So um, this was Burju Bacal and Kevin Silmore won those um, for 2020. And then the same thing for 2021, we had two first place winners and I don't have their pictures because it was last minute there. Travis Emery and Georgios Sorellis were the winners of that. <clears throat> so then we wanted to, to thank uh, our fearless leader, Mario, who for the last three years has served as second vice chair, first vice chair and chair. Um, and so we, we thank him and thank him again for his service. And now the remaining awards are the sort of the standard big cast division awards that we give out every year. The first one being the W. David Smith Graduate Publication Award. And so this is to recognize an outstanding publication that was written and published while this person was a graduate student or an undergraduate student, and it's sponsored by Process Systems Enterprises. And the winner of that was Dominic Bongartz. And 
I think I saw him get on online. So congratulations. Oh, yeah, I see him waving there, if you look. So congratulations again. Then the, the next award is the David Himmelblau Award. And, and that recognizes new and novel contributions of an individual or a group to the use of computers in chemical engineering education. It's sponsored by the Cash Corporation. And the winner there was Tom Adams from McMaster. And I, I see him as well. Um, the next one is Outstanding Young Researcher, which recognizes an individual under the age of 40 for outstanding contributions to the chemical engineering computing and systems technology literature, and it's sponsored by Air Products. And that was Farouk Hassan. I don't know. Oh, there he is. There's Farouk. Congratulations. And then for Computing Practice Award, it recognized an individual for an outstanding contribution to the practice or application of chemical engineering, computing, and systems technology, and it's sponsored by Aspen. And it was won by Sal Garcia. I don't know. Oh, there is Sal. No. Congratulations, Sal. Good to see you. <clears throat> and then this, this is actually a new award that just was um, started this year. It's called the CAS Distinguished Service Award, and it's to recognize demonstrated outstanding leadership within division over an extended time. And um, it goes to Ray Adamitis, who was not able to attend in person. So this is the first able to congratulate him. So congratulations, Ray. Thank you for your service. It's well recognized. And then finally, the Computing and Chemical Engineering Award, which recognizes an individual for outstanding contributions to chemical engineering, computing, and systems technology, which is and it's sponsored by the Dow Chemical Company, goes to Claire Adjaman at Imperial. And before Claire talks, um, Stratos asked to be able to, to uh, introduce Claire. So I will turn it over to you, Stratos. Yeah. I'm and I will, I will stop sharing so that you can Great. share your screen. Thank you, Matt. All right. Well, it's a great pleasure for me obviously, to uh, introduce Claire, Professor Antiman from Imperial College. Um, Claire has been bringing all along this um, very distinguished French flair to our uh, computing and process systems engineering community, community that we all appreciate, her elegant, a sense of uh, humor and her elegant uh, uh, pronunciation, you know, the way she speaks and everything she does has this French flair. So, let, so if we go back and trace a little bit her background, you know, so obviously she comes from France, uh, born near Paris and grow, she was grown up in Orleans, not the New Orleans, don't mix it with Louisiana, so the Orleans, you know, the old Orleans kind of. Uh, but she has a very interesting background coming from uh, uh, her family dispersed through various, uh, you know, through North America, Europe, and Middle East. And it's interesting to note also that there's continuation with our last year's winner, Professor Mahmoud El Halbaki, notably because uh, Claire's father actually was born in uh, Egypt. So there you go. So uh, then, her earlier stage, you know, here are some photos from uh, her early beginning of Claire at uh, various ages from 16 months to 10 and 14. She, you know, uh, she started, you know, school obviously in France and then at early years, you know, for her last year of high school, she went to the Lycée school in uh, to the French Lycée school in London. What I would like to note, you know, Claire is there in the circles, her early affinity to global optimization, right? You know, so you can see at age four, 14, she, is, she prefers the extremum, you know, at age 10, you know, so the global minimum kind is in the middle. So that's something that was noted at the very early years. Then she moved to, you know, it's after her, uh, 
friends let's say here are Simufu Imperial College and you can see a picture from the uh, 1993 year book you know so when she was about to graduate and then she moved uh, to Princeton for her PhD years you know there and obviously she follows a very prestigious academic tree you know of uh, the famous and perhaps the most eminent uh, academic tree in the process systems engineering community from uh, the sergeant tree ignacio professor the late late professor fludas and claire okay and that's obviously almost a necessary condition for the class computing award it's not a sufficient replica okay then um a family started, you know, for Claire when she moved uh, back to Imperial. I'll come back to this, and then I would like to introduce another uh, Greek connection to her life. You know, Professor Costas Padelivis. They got married in 2004 after Claire joined Imperial around uh, 1998, if I recall correctly. And you can see some happy family moments, notably you know, Mark, you know, so they have two kids, you know, they have Mark and Cleo, and uh, notably you can notice Mark, obviously, eagerly at five months old, he's reading some classics. It's not ancient Greek, uh, it's uh, actually the, the famous book on systematic methods for, you know what, of uh, Grossman, Bigler, and Westerberg, right? And, uh, and then obviously, uh, participating in all the major conference, conferences in our pro profession, and notably here you can see FIPSI and one of the major activities there obviously is dancing. You can see the family and I'm sure Costas is leading the dance up front. More seriously, you know, about Claire, you know, one notable thing that I had the honor of uh, being one of her teachers in the early days, she was destined to go to the top and she was always the top person in everything she was doing. So she was top of her class and she amassed all the awards that Imperial gives to the undergraduate class and uh, you know, top of her class graduating the Hinsley Medal, the governor's prize, you know, and there are a number like three, four other awards she got uh, on her pursuit of her undergraduate studies. Then she went to do her PhD with Chris there. And also there, she amassed all the possible awards that exist for PhD students. And uh, a notable one here is the Porter of the Jacobus Honorific, Honor, Honorific Fellowship that is awarded to the best PhD student among uh, uh, Princeton that is offered. She, was destined for an academic career. So we really fought hard to come back to Imperial at that time. And uh, obviously we are not really surprised to see Claire rising to the profession, becoming a professor in 2011, and now becoming a founding director of the Institute of Molecular Science Engineering and leading the Sargent Center for Process Systems Engineering. She has been a pioneering, you know, really an outstanding researcher, essentially establishing, putting her stub on the field by pioneering through pioneering contributions in bringing together the molecular modeling part, it integrated this with process design, with her elegant work that she continues to do on global optimization and linking property predictions with modeling, integrating this as uh, in a modern day computing software tool. She has published extensively, high uh, 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 citation index as you can see, and it's interesting to see you know, how she has been growing. She has grown in stature, having graduated, you know, having a group of approximately 40 students that have graduated, another 10 students now in her, in her group, with over 60 master students and 27 postdocs. So that's another token of her impact on the field. She has amassed all possible prestigious awards that in the profession she has become a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK in 2015, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 2016. She has been a fellow of IKME 
since 2013. And, you know, some of her awards include, you know, I mean, I have the whole list here. That will take the entire hour. So I will just highlight perhaps the most recent one, the 2020 Elizabeth Colbert Memorial Lecture from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And just at a glance, you know, just some of, uh, you know, from that's some pictures from her inaugural lecture, you know, when uh, somebody becomes a professor at Imperial College, she or he has to give an inaugural lecture, you can see here, from the dinner with the late Professor Flutas on the left. Then in the middle, you can see Mark already draws some pictures about global optimization and phase diagrams there. And then there's a message from Cleo uh, to mom with love. And then on the right hand side there, you can appreciate you know, some uh, uh, you know, well-suspected individuals. That's from the Roger Sargent lecture that Frank Doyle delivered and you can see Claire there along with Nile and the, the person introducing her. So with that, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Claire Eisenman, the winner this year of the Computing in Chemical Engineering Award, which recognizes an individual for outstanding contributions to chemical engineering computing and systems technology. And Claire has demonstra demonstrated this through her outstanding and pioneer contributions to the integration of molecular modeling and processes engineering, global optimization, and the industrial application of CISED methods. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Clara Zeman, who is going to deliver a presentation on molecular level decisions for design and optimization. Thank you, Stratos, very much for your very kind words. I have to ask before I start my talk, do you see my background the right way around or is it uh, back to front the way I see it? It's okay. It looks okay. Oh, wonderful. It's a bit unnerving here. Um, so let me try and share my screen again. And hopefully that has crossed the Atlantic a bit faster this time. Um, so it's really a great pleasure and, and uh, honor to be receiving uh, this award. Matt has done an outstanding job. I received the plaque uh, yesterday. So uh, that's, that's really great. Um, I have to say it's uh, my favorite award. Um, it's so humbling to receive this from the community. And I'm really uh, sorry that I couldn't make it. Uh, to Boston. So I'm also really grateful that you've taken the time to organize this event and uh, to come along to it. Um, so to get started, um, of course, this is no after dinner talk, uh, it's kind of an after breakfast talk, I guess, for most of you. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is to try and, and go into some depth in, in some of my research, but also to try and keep it a little light at times. And, and most importantly, to thank the many, many people behind this award. Um, it's something that, that uh, I owe to many people. Uh, so and to highlight the areas of my group's research, to reflect a little bit on the journey um, and the influences that have got me interested in, in the problems that I've been inter interested in, and to look very briefly to the future. Um, so first of all, I have to, to say some thanks to, to Stratos in particular. Um, Stratos joined Imperial as I was a third year student there, and I think I was in the first class that he taught. Um, and he came with all the energy and enthusiasm that we know, uh, and he was really instrumental in uh, encouraging me to, to get to the US for my PhD uh, and in helping me navigate a system that I didn't know. Um, so from, from that point onwards, Stratos has been a great supporter um, and a great friend, and um, it's been really a pleasure to interact with him throughout my, my career. And I should also thank uh, Ian Metcalf, who had been to Princeton. Um, he was a, a professor in the department as well, and he'd been to Princeton and was, was full of uh, advice and insights, which really helped me to uh, make decisions. Um, so some, some great teachers and mentors from the start. And of course, when... Um, I got to Princeton. I was really pleased to join Chris's group. Again, um, Chris was really welcoming and ambitious, uh, full of, of ideas and uh, expectations as well, which, which was great. Um, and so he got me working in global optimization, which I absolutely love. So this was four years 
um, of really delving into the mathematics and the algorithmic aspects of global optimization. Generally, um, taking problems from the literature, so not thinking too much about what the problems were, were about, taking the formulations as they stood from the literature. And so our first paper was uh, in escape proceedings, um, together with uh, Yanis Andrulakis and Kostas Maranas. Um, and then we went on to publish some more papers on global optimization for NLPs, um, both on the theory side and the algorithmic side, implementation, uh, and of course, continuing on uh, looking at MINLPs. Uh, so this was really hardcore optimization and it was really great fun. But um, the group at the time was a really stimulating environment and there was a bit more to it than MINLPs. And that really influenced the, my thinking and the direction that I uh, took on uh, later on for my career. So in particular, uh, Chris was working with uh, Randy Esposito on deterministic global optimization for nonlinear optimal control problems, so looking at dynamic systems. He had been interested for a while in phase equilibrium and phase stability. Uh, Connor McDonald was graduating when I joined the group, and Steve Harding joined the group shortly after me. So um, we looked a lot at, at those problems as well, and their work was really inspirational. And of course, at the time, Chris was starting uh, his first steps in uh, looking at molecular modeling and uh, the energy minimizations of peptides and protein and all the uh, protein folding that he would go on to do later on. And so there was a lot of, of, of talk of molecules and, and how you might model them and understand them. And uh, while I wasn't directly working on these problems, they certainly influenced my thinking. And uh, we had some great group meetings where we uh, learned about this work, but also reviewed papers from other groups. Um, in the area. So it was really a, a fantastic learning environment. And so when I joined Imperial, my idea was that I would want to, to dedicate myself to trying to expand the envelope of process design, trying to move away or move beyond uh, what we all knew as process design problems, uh, trying to minimize the cost, the profit of some on some process where we might um, optimize the operating conditions, the temperature, pressures, compositions, and so on. We might do some process synthesis, uh, choosing what units should be connected and how. And to expand that envelope to also include molecular choices. So to start from uh, atom groups and to think about what molecules should take part in the process. Uh, would be then uh, solvents, which is what I've worked mostly on, um, heat transfer fluids as well. Uh, perhaps catalyst, although I haven't really worked in that area, but uh, definitely a, a very interesting and important area to work on. So thinking about um, expanding this and setting um, the design space to be a larger design space that includes molecular decisions as well as process decisions and focusing on this field uh, of computer aided molecular and process design. Um, at the time, um, when I was doing my PhD, of course, there was a lot of work coming out of the groups of Rafik Ghani, of Sandro Macchietto, Luke Acheni, and others looking at molecular design and applying optimization to that problem, but focused on the whole on solvent or molecular properties as a target rather than process objectives. Uh, I should say that Stratos was also doing some really interesting work in this area. Um, and so if you can solve a problem like this, um, so an optimization problem again, but that has this larger design space, uh, you can come up with a rank list of designs uh, that will include molecules as well as the process topology and the process operating conditions. You can do some experimental verification and it's really important uh, to realize that with these kinds of approaches, we are always going to be a little bit removed from the detailed design because our models are necessarily going to be a little bit um, a little bit rough, let's say, uh, because they require a lot of transferability. Um, so experimental verification, which maybe enables us to test our models uh, and some iteration through this process until we're ready to make our choices and to proceed to a detailed design. So this is really adding molecular design to the synthesis part, uh, the conceptual part of process design. Okay, so two key questions here. How can we expand the envelope of process design? What elements do we need to make this happen? Um, 
And what are the benefits of doing this? Is this, is this really worth it? Of course, in principle, we all know from optimization that if you expand the set of choices that you have, you are going to get a better objective function. But how much better? Is it really worth the effort? So in order to tackle this problem, um, I realized quickly that I needed three uh, strands of research, uh, or at least three uh, elements. They were not all intended to be research elements at first. Um, so optimization theory and algorithms, of course, uh, I wouldn't want to, to get away from that. Product and process design, and especially how you formulate those problems and, and how you might break them down and decompose them to make them tractable. And an area which I thought was something I needed, but perhaps wouldn't do research in, molecular thermodynamics and property prediction. And that proved to be quite wrong there. So this started off as separate strands that I thought I could just combine. But as my career has progressed, I think they've become more and more intertwined. And um, as I hope I will show you some evidence that you really need to get into the details of the property prediction to do some effective work on product and process design. So there are many people that contributed to, uh, to this work over the years, and I'll be thanking some of them during the talk. But there's also a community. And so uh, the CAS community is, is one that is very important and very obvious one, I guess, if you look at, at these. But there's also uh, a community of molecular thermodynamicists and, and molecular modelers that I've been really fortunate to interact with. Initially, uh, that I met through conferences, in particular, the PPE, PPD conference series and the FORMS conference series, which is a CASH series that started in 2000 uh, and uh, it's being held again next year. Um, and more recently, I've got involved in establishing a journal called Molecular Systems Design and Engineering, which is a collaboration between the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Institution for Chemical Engineers uh, in, the, in the UK, um, and which uh, organizes a two yearly symposium as well. Um, so those have been really great places to get inspiration, to, to discover new techniques, and to uh, try and understand better how we can use them in product and process design. A particularly influ influential grouping for me has been um, what we've called the Molecular Systems Engineering Team. So some photos from the mid-2000s, I'm afraid, and this is a slide I used to use in, in those years, where we started a really um, in-depth collaboration between three molecular thermodynamicists, Amparo Galindo, John Jackson, and Eric Muller, and uh, three uh, PSC people whom uh, you all know. And uh, so, so Amparo and George have a physical chemistry background. Um, so, so really uh, looking at the details of the theory and Eric is a simulator um, with a chemical engineering background. And it's been a really fruitful collaboration. And what we've developed as a kind of understanding for, for what molecular systems engineering might mean is, um, first of all, that we want to study functional materials at the molecular level. So we need to bring that molecular understanding beyond, let's say, correlative models to study polymers, organic crystals, microemulsions, liquid crystals, and that we need to be developers of fundamental uh, tools to model these systems, be them perturbation theories or molecular simulations. To bring a systems angle to this, we want to take a product and process centered view. Um, so we want to, to start from the big picture and the, the overall performance objectives that we have. We also want to develop generic approaches that are automated and transferable, and that are also multi-scale in nature that allow us to link the molecular scale to that of the process and to the functional performance of the product. And we want to be doing that in, in formal ways. And the engineering aspect is the focus on industrial, industrially relevant problems, and also importantly, the focus on design. We're not modeling for the sake of modeling, and we're not just trying to understand, we're trying to come up with better designs. And in that context, in the early stages of my career, um, John Cordiner from Syngenta was really influential um, in my thinking, but also in, in really helping me uh, secure my first PhD students and, and get the group started in, in this area, which was really great. And also, I was really happy to, or lucky to work with Mitsubishi Chemical and Peter Kolo, who was a great collaborator, and really leveraging some of the relationships that my colleagues at the Center for Process Systems Engineering had established before I had even arrived. And I was really um, lucky to, to, re, to, to go into such a, a stimulating center with so many people willing to, to help me out in the early days of my career. 
Okay, so, so thinking about um, these different strands of research, I want to now take you through a little bit the, the concept of computer-aided molecular process design through um, an example. We're going to look at carbon dioxide capture as, as an example. And the first thing we're going to learn is that there is no escape from thermodynamics. Um, so the problem is, is a well-known one. Um, carbon dioxide capture is an important technology in terms of achieving net zero. Um, and that is traditionally done with uh, chemical absorption, so amine-based solvent. There are some conventional solvents that are well established, like monoethanolamine um, and others. Um, so, and, and, and the, the, the process configuration also, we have some, some um, very well-known configurations, although some ex very exciting new configurations that are coming up. But there are some challenges with those existing te technologies, especially if they need to be deployed at the scale that we need them. One is the energetic cost of solvent recovery, which is very high. Uh, and another is the environmental and health impacts due to solvent degradation, the corrosiveness of the solvent and solvent losses. And so you can see that I'm mentioning the solvent a lot. And indeed, um, the choice of solvent has a big impact on the performance of this process. So if we think about how we might model the process to look at changing the solvent and the impact of changing the solvent, what we'd like to be able to do is to get some, some profiles for our columns, for example, temperature profiles and liquid composition profiles so that we can figure out how well our absorber is working and what sort of regeneration costs we might have. In order to do that, we need to understand what's taking place in the solvent phase. And unfortunately, what's taking place is a little bit complicated because this is a chemical absorption process. We have quite a large set of, of reactions taking place. So this is the set of reactions for, let's say, something like monoethanolamine. And we have, uh, if you count the, the components, so the molecular and the charged components, the neutron charged components, we have 13 species in this system. Now, we have some models that work really well uh, to tell us what the phase and chemical equilibria might be and what uh, the chemical uh, kinetics might be in these systems. Um, unfortunately, those models require very many parameters. So if you take, for example, the ENRTL model or, um, or the Chang-Genifac model, you're talking about of the order of 70 parameters to model uh, just monoethanolamine, water, and CO2. And so that's a lot of parameters, which means we need a lot of extensive data on this system, including speciation data. And unfortunately, that data are not forthcoming. Speciation data are available for very, very few solvents. And so if we want to start understanding the impact of changing the solvent, we're a little bit stuck. And this is where we need to take a, a thermodynamic detour to try and develop predictive techniques that are going to tell us what's happening in the absorber um, in the absence of speciation or even phase equilibrium, chemical equilibrium data. OK, and so here uh, comes in a, a chance meeting again in my very early days at Imperial. Uh, on the same day that I started, George Jackson also uh, started in the department, uh, just have, I think arrived fresh from Sheffield, where he had just been working on an equation of state, which he started during its postdoc in, in the US. Um, but he'd been developing a new version of the equation of state called Saft VR square well. And that equation of state had some really attractive features. First of all, um, it's able to model this, the impact of non-sphericity on the phase behavior of molecules. So that means you can model from ethane to polyethylene with a single um, modeling framework. And in fact, uh, in fact, they had shown that um, you can develop models for homologous series. So with the exact same parameters, you can do the whole series of, of alkanes, for example, and same thing for alcohols. Um, just changing on the basis of a number of, of carbons in the molecule. And so, of course, that, that's very exciting. And it's it, to somebody who's interested in design, as I was, it uh, straight away brings to mind the concept of group contribution. And so with, with George and uh, Amparo Galindo, who also joined uh, the department at the time, we set out to develop a group contribution version of the equation that we could uh, use for design where we could really play, play um, Lego, if you like, with the molecule. And that took us about uh, 10 years to, to do um, in, in terms of we didn't get started straight away, but it took 10 years to get there from the initial idea to getting the funding and, and getting the projects going. 
Um, but we, we did get there. And um, that this is great for thermodynamics. So we can do some really predictive work in terms of the phase equilibrium of, of some systems, the vapor liquid equilibrium or liquid liquid equilibrium. What was missing for design, of course, is that we'd also like to know about the energetic requirements of uh, our process. And for that, we need the caloric properties. And of course, you can derive the caloric properties from an equation of state. But what had been found is that you, can, you cannot get both accurate prediction of caloric properties and phase equilibria. You have to make a choice in parameterizing your model. Now, at that point, we were very lucky to recruit uh, Tom Lafitte, a postdoc who had come from France, who had been doing some work in this area. And what Tom showed was you needed to get to the details of the intermolecular potential um, between those, those bids in the, in, in the molecular model in order to get both accuracy in both caloric properties and phase equilibria. And so we set out to modify those details and to go to a knee potential, which is a generalized energy potential. These are details I would never have expected to get involved in, uh, but actually they turned out to be completely um, revolutionary in our ability to do molecular and process design, because now we have a single system with which we can predict both the energy requirements and the uh, phase equilibria performance. We do not need um, to make any assumptions like uh, ideal mixing. We can look at um, the non-ideal mixing and that impact on the caloric properties. So for a pure component like CO2, you can get good phase equilibria, single phase densities, and importantly, the heat capacity. In what I show, the curves will always be uh, the soft calculations and the symbols, the experimental data. Okay, so we were able to then predict the phase equilibria here, this is CO2 and methane, this curve here is, is predicted. And of course, with our group contribution method, we can combine these two advances and predict CO2 in different alkanes. And we can take that concept further. And we've had some really fruitful collaborations in the pharma industry, um, looking at using this predictive technique to predict the solubility of different um, active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs. So this is the case, for example, of uh, ibuprofen and ketoprofen in uh, acetone. Actually, ketoprofen should be in, in blue. Um, and I should say that those data were used, were generated without using any solubility data whatsoever on those compounds. So that shows you the predictive range of the approach. Now, if we want to use that for chemisorption, so go back to chemisorption, we're still missing the reactions. And so we need to somehow model the chemical equilibria that is taking place in these systems. To do this, we're going to use another feature of SAFT. Uh, which is that it contains association sites. So on, on our molecular model, we have sites that are used to mimic hydrogen bonding. In fact, if you look at the details of the theory, both sites also exist between those fused segments. And with an infinite energy, they make the molecule non-spherical. But with a finite energy, they can mimic hydrogen bonding, polar interactions. And so we can use those to model um, this interaction between carbon dioxide and MEA and mimic the formation of charged species. Of course, what we don't have here are the charges themselves, but we can see we have these larger aggregates whose energy is going to be different from the separate molecules. Now, this is really interesting because what it means is that, you know, this the formation of these uh, species that are bound is hidden within the equation itself. It's not an explicit component. So we're modeling a mixture of MEA and CO2 and, and water, which I haven't shown here. We're modeling formation of bicarbonate and bicarbonate without actually explicitly modeling those compounds. So we just have three components, but we can infer the impact of this association on phase equilibria. You show here, you see here the phase equilibria in uh, monoethanolamine. And we can even, extract from the equation, from the, at the end of the calculation, what fraction of CO2 molecules, for example, are bound to two MEA molecules. And we can predict what the speciation might be. We can predict how much carbonate we can expect and how much bicarbonate we can expect. Of course, we know that for MEA, but for many other solvents, we don't know this. And so if we can build up our set of groups, we can expand the range of amines that we can model 
and we can get to a point where we're ready for molecular design. So we spent the last few years building up that table, uh, some really hard work by Felipe Verdomo um, here. And you can see some of the types of amines that we can model, and you can see some of the phase, uh, phase diagrams that we're able to generate. So here, um, CO2, water, and DMCA, very interesting phase behavior. Uh, and you can see that we have just two, two data points in this system here. And we can do this for, for systems for which we have no data whatsoever. So we've been building up this table. This is what it looks like recently. And I have to say that PSC uh, approaches and thinking have really important in pushing this forward. First of all, the directions we've been taking are driven by the uh, combination of understanding of a theory, but also the needs of conceptual design and the applications. Why do we need this equation? In which direction do we need to, to make it evolve? Uh, PSC techniques have been really important to develop the table because we need reliable parameter estimation, as well as the ability to calculate reliably this very complex phase equilibria. So algorithms play an important role here. And we've also been fortunate to be able to license um, the equation of state. So it's now available in GPROMS, and that's been really important in, in terms of our collaborations with partners and in terms of being able to um, understand and, and, and discuss applications in more depth and transferring any new developments of what we do uh, to, uh, to the people who want to use them. <clears throat> so now that we've got the thermodynamic framework, we can embark on molecular design. And what I want to illustrate next is why it's important to look at the process as well as the molecular properties. So how can we find better solvents for CO2 capture? Well, one thing we've done is we've gone out to the public and uh, we've, done a bit of, uh, we've done a bit of outreach. And so you can see here uh, two former PhD students, Ed Graham, uh, who is now at, at MIT, and Eliana Grant, who is now at uh, McKinsey, um, working with, uh, with, with some new students here to try and identify some molecules uh, for CO2 capture. So we had the children put together molecules, and then you can see we have a model here on the computer, and we can uh, enter the molecule, molecular structure and predict the performance um, of the molecule in CO2 capture. So that was a lot of fun, but it didn't um, give us many new or interesting molecules, because of course, this is looking for a needle, um, for a needle in a haystack. So we need, of course, some, some better methods, and we've had a really uh, fruitful and long-standing collaboration um, with uh, partners at uh, SURF in particular. I saw that uh, Sakis Papadopoulos is here. Um, so we, we've had a really fantastic collaboration looking at um, design from properties all the way to pilot plant. Um, so Sakis and Panosephalis led that, that project. Um, and so this is, these are some figures from one of our recent papers where uh, we used uh, Sakis's approach to identify through multi-object optimization some promising solvents. And you can see here, we're looking at pure solvent properties. So things like the molar volume and the vapor pressure, these are all related to process performance, but also some other metrics that are related to the environmental and safety performance of the process. Um, and that's in collaboration with Charles Chalmers University. Um, and so it's important to consider those those very uh, those different aspects. Then taking that through to modeling of the mixtures, and this is where the phase equilibria comes in, um, to measurement with the pilot plant, um, or in a small scale pilot plant to use in a rotating pack bed uh, process. Uh, so really exciting project showing that you can identify, and we identified a mixture of uh, S1N um, shown here, and the MCA as a potentially promising um, new mixture for CO2 capture, together with new in process in intensification technology as shown here. So this is a really great um, way to approach the problem. And but what we've been trying to do as well um, in the group is to enable simultaneous molecular and process design. So to think about <clears throat> how can we integrate those decisions about which molecules to consider with the optimization of the process itself. So we've been looking at this in the context of a 400 megawatt CCGT power plant shown here with some of the uh, targets that we have. And we've developed an equilibrium model of this, I should say. Um, so neglecting in the first instance mass transfer limitations. But in this case, so we're trying to um, minimize the 
total annualized cost of the system. We have some design and property constraints. And we have some structural property models, as well as, of course, the, the process model, the mesh equations, and so on, and some molecular feasibility constraints. So this is a standard process design problem, except that we have these n variables, which represent the molecular structure of the solvent we want to design. So we're using the kind of model that I've been describing, the SAFT model, and we are doing this uh, like Lego. So we're using the group contribution version of the equation of state. And so our process decision variables are um, the lean loading, the desorber pressure, and the lean solvent temperature. And our molecular design space consists of the groups uh, shown here. So we have a few groups that we can use to make a new amines or alkanol amines. Now, it's not easy to solve these problems. And one of the reasons it's not easy to solve these optimization problems is that when the optimizer identifies a new combination of groups and a new potential solvent, chances are that solvent is not going to work as a solvent. You may find that um, it's not liquid at the operating temperatures that you, the bounds on the operating temperatures that you've set for your process. Um, so, or, or it's only liquid, it's, you don't have a, enough of a vapor phase, or perhaps you have liquid-liquid separation, or perhaps you can't achieve your target purity, uh, even with an infinitely sized absorber. So thermodynamically, it's just not feasible to achieve the performance that you want. And whenever that happens, if you apply a standard outer approximation algorithm, you find that you get into a lot of trouble in the primal problem. You spend a lot of time solving a problem that cannot be solved, and you're getting very little information to help you move to the next solvent in the master problem. And so we've been working on, on um, a series of algorithms and a series of examples where we use feasibility tests as a precursor here. Um, an idea actually that, uh, again, Stratos uh, used in some work quite, quite some years ago, where we test um, the properties of the pure, the pure properties of the solvent and those of the aqueous solution to see wh whether, whether they are within some suitable ranges. So we don't have target values, but we have ranges for them. And then we apply a number of other thermodynamic tests. We check whether the solvents exhibit liquid-liquid demixing at the absorber operating conditions. We check whether uh, we eliminate some operating conditions, also some, some solvents that cannot give us the cyclic capacity that we need for the absorption to take place. And we tighten the bounds on the operating pressure of the dissolver. And all of these are designed either to eliminate some solvents or to make the NLP easier to solve by adapting um, the starting point and the bounds to the particular solvent that we're considering at this moment, but it's all automated. Okay, so none of this is, has, requires user intervention. And this works pretty well. So we're able to solve uh, problems with different sizes of the design space. So here we've put in some slightly different uh, constraints in terms of the number of aiming groups that we, we can have, so four or two. And we find different optimal solutions. Um, so in this restricted space, we find one, three, diamino to propanol, and this sulfur free here, there's a couple of isomers, uh, so I haven't given it, a, given it a name. Okay, so now could we have intuited this by just looking at the molecular structure and the properties of these molecules? So let's do some, some comparison using MEA uh, as a benchmark. So in terms of CO2 solubility, um, we would find that sulfur free is indeed the highest performance solvent. But if we look at the heat of absorption, and so therefore maybe the, economic, the energetic cost of regenerating the solvent, we find that on the whole, MEA behaves better. And then if we look at normalized solvent properties, um, we, we, the green star indicates which solvent is the best. So you can see here sol free, here it's MEA, here it's MEA again, and here it's DAP. And so you can see that we get, first of all, a mixed picture, uh, but also that uh, uh, it's, you know, sol free, for example, only comes out, which is the best of the three, only comes out as best in a couple of the metrics. If we look at the results of the optimization of the process, we can see that sol free appears to be the best by quite a long margin compared especially to MEA. And that is essentially driven by the greater cyclic capacity of this solvent. Um, and that reduces significantly uh, 
um, the energy consumption and of course the solvent circulation rate as well. Okay, so better solvent properties do not necessarily yield better overall performance. And you can see a very strong interaction between the process level decisions and the molecular level decisions. And uh, we found that the optimal molecule is sensitive both to the process specifications and the process variables. So if we change the process specifications in terms of the purity that we want, for example, for our CO2 stream, then that will have an impact on what is the best molecule here, which hints that we might need to apply some robust design uh, techniques in order to identify solvents that are high performance across the board or in, in a more consistent way. Okay. So hopefully I've illustrated the importance of, of considering the process and um, the um, molecules at the same time. So now I'm going to shift gear a little bit and talk about optimization. I mentioned that the optimization problem was quite hard to solve and we've, we've had to do a lot of work um, to make sure that we can solve it reliably from different starting points. But I haven't really spoken about the existence of local solutions. And of course, um, local solutions and global solutions are one of my first uh, passions. And so um, I have to admit that we can only solve the problem I've just shown you to, shown you to local optimality and that all the best we can do is to try uh, different starting points at this point uh, to try and in the hope of finding the best solution. But sometimes the global solution is important because it's the best solution. It would be great to minimize the cost of the CO2 capture processes. But in some cases, it's the only meaningful answer, and that's the case of phase equilibrium and phase stability calculations, where you really want to minimize Gibbs free energy to make sure you find the stable phase configuration. Or if you're doing safety critical applications, then it's the only safe answer. So what we've done in the group is focused mostly on asymptotically complete and complete methods by the description of the classification of Neumeier, and really, um, try to work on that modeling trade-off between model accuracy and model tractability. So typically, if we have models that are not very tractable, we will use multi-level single linkage algorithm of Kucherenko and Sitsko, um, which gives us a way to identify starting points in the space of possibilities and does have properties of um, convergence at infinite time. And if we can, we use deterministic global optimization or develop algorithms um, for, for that purpose. And of course, increasingly, uh, we're using surrogate models to enable the use of deterministic global optimization, where the original model does not allow us to do that. So optimization, um, we have an abundance of optimization problems. And uh, just to, to highlight a few areas where uh, I've worked with my students and postdocs, we did some early work on dynamic optimization. Um, and that is really important in the work that we do on the design of reaction solvents, where actually I've been doing quite a bit of experimental work uh, to generate data because there's very little data that's reliable enough in the literature for us to build our predictive models from. And so parameter estimation uh, for dynamic models is really important here. Um, we've done some, some work on uh, parameter estimation for thermodynamic models, for force fields, for energy minimization, more of that later. Of course, on the MINLPs, um, we've done some work on CAM, CAMD and CAMPD, but also product design. Recently, um, Tanush Karia has been working on uh, mixed integer polynomial problems, and he presented a paper last week. Um, I want to point out as well that my former students, Nikos Kazazakis, started um, Octaract following his PhD on uh, global optimization. And that was just released in, in GAN. So that's really great to see that technology evolving um, and moving forward. In bilevel optimization, we've looked at phase equilibrium and phase stability and the design of experiments um, with two players. More on that in a little bit. And multi-objective optimization is something that we do increasingly for parameter estimation for thermodynamic models. And it's a really powerful uh, technology in that, in that context, um, because otherwise you, you tend to have very arbitrary ways between different properties, but also for design for sustainability. Um, and we had a, a paper last week uh, in the session in honor of Chris on some of the work we're doing in th that area. So for this talk, I had to choose something 
So I've decided to tell you a little bit about bilevel optimization. It's going to be a little bit superficial, but hopefully it will give you a, a flavor for, uh, for what we do. So we became interested in bilevel problems uh, where you have, as part of the constraints, an optimization problem. Okay, so you have uh, an outer problem with an objective function big F, which involves variables, variables X and Y, and we're minimizing respect to X and Y, subject to some constraints. And as part of the constraint, we have this inner minimization problem where we're now minimizing respect to Y only. So this is parametric in X. Um, and so we have a minimization of little f of x and y subject to some constraints. Um, and so we were interested in how you might solve such problems. And the approach we came up with is an algorithm we call the branch and sandwich algorithm, which was developed with uh, Xenia Kleniati and uh, Remis Polavicius. So two postdoc who did, postdocs who did some really great work. So this is a deterministic global optimization algorithm um, designed for non-convex bilevel problems. So where you have non-convexity in the inner problem and the outer problem. The main components of the algorithm are that we partition both the inner and the outer spaces without distinction. So we're going to generate bounds on the solution of the inner problem and on the solution of the, of the upper problem, outer problem. And we're going to use those bounds to make decisions about which regions of space to explore. So we develop, we can develop ways to generate those bounds. But the fact that we're looking at both problems at the same time means that we're going to need to be quite careful about how we manage our branching and our exploration of the solution space. And so we have some novel tree management taking place. So it's a mix of theory and algorithmic um, aspects that enable us to solve these problems. And what I'm going to show you is a very brief glimpse of how this works um, through an example. So this is a, a classical example in the literature. It's actually an integer example where the outer problem is to minimize minus x minus 10y um, with respect to, um, or subject to y being in the uh, solution set of the um, inner problem. Um, which I, I, didn't, I didn't actually put on that slide. Um, so uh, we have a, an inner problem here and Y has to, uh, to be the solution at the global, the global solution of the inner problem. Okay, so if you think about the whole space of X and Y, initially it's depicted as such. And let's assume, you have to, to trust me here, that we can generate some bounds on the outer and on the inner problem. So we have a lower bound, for example, on the outer solution and an upper bound on that solution here. And we have some bounds on the inner problem, one and four. We're then going to partition the space. And so in this case, we're going to choose to partition along the Y space. Now, this is important. Um, when we consider a point in this region here in node three, when we look at the inner problem, we need to think about, for a given x, for example, we need to think about what is the global solution of the inner problem over all of y. So we can only assess the performance of x in node three by looking at what, what's happening in terms of y and the inner problem in nodes two and three. Okay, so this is where the exploration of the inner tree comes in. And so we need to have to do book, a bit of bookkeeping and to always keep in mind that we're looking at this, the inner problem in both regions to make a decision about where the global solution of the outer problem might lie. So if we generate bounds on those two uh, nodes, we find that the lower bound on the outer or upper solution is minus 18 here. And uh, that is greater than our upper bound. So we know that the global solution cannot lie in this region, just classic fathoming from a branch and boundary. So we can fathom that node too, right? But we cannot fathom it completely because we still need to be exploring it to assess the points, uh, the values of X in node three. So we still need to be looking at all of Y. So we introduce the concept of outer fathoming. It's no longer something we consider from the perspective of the outer problem, the overall problem, but we keep it for the inner problem. We branch again, 
And because we need to keep improving our bounds on the inner problems and the outer problems at the same time, and we're still interested in the inner problem in two, we branch both on node two and node three. So we have these four regions here. Now, when we compute the bounds on node five, we find that actually there is no way that the global solution of the overall problem can lie in this region. And in fact, the global solution of the inner problem over X2 can never be in this region either. So we can completely eliminate this node from consideration. Now, what about seven? We were keeping seven in reserve because we wanted to be able to assess the points in X2 here. But now that we know these points are no longer relevant, we can also get rid of node seven. Okay, so we just left with not node four as the open node. We know that the global solution is going to lie here and node six to help us to evaluate the optimality of the points here. And on and on we go. So it's not an easy algorithm um, to implement, uh, but we did implement it um, in Minotaur with an interface via Ample to help us to do the, the reformulation of the functions and, and, and of the various bounding problems and using uh, GAMS Baron for the global solutions of the, of the problems. We developed a library of test problems and I just want to highlight a few of those. First of all, we revisited some classics, uh, looking at flexibility index problems. And so you can see that with the algorithm, this is the, the, the time that we, um, the, the time for completion. They're quite small problems in terms of the number of uncertain parameters and the number of controls, but it's very promising that we're able to solve these non-convex problems to global optimality quite quickly. We also, through a collaboration with, uh, with uh, Sal Garcia at Lili, um, developed, um, or applied this algorithm uh, to the design of experiments for output space exploration, something that uh, we, we published a few years ago now, uh, where we looked at, um, at the same time, trying to explore the input space of uh, experimental parameters, as well as the maximum possible exploration of the outputs from the experiments. Um, more in that paper. Um, so that starts to take me to, to some of the work that we've been doing with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And I want to now shift to, uh, to the last topic that I want to cover, which is uh, product design with applications in the pharma and agrochemical industry by predicting the unpredictable. Um, so that's a quote I'll, I'll explain in a second. Uh, so really, this is about computational chemistry meeting surrogate modeling and optimization and how that can enable product design. So this is uh, focused on solid forms. So you know that many medicines are administered in solid form, so you take them as tablets. Uh, but unfortunately, organic molecules can often crystallize in more than one form, um, and those are called polymorphs. And polymorphs have very different, different polymorphs have very different properties. And uh, this is something that was well known, but became really impactful in the case of Ritonavir when um, after two years of manufacture, a more stable form emerged during manufacture and it was impossible to make the metastable form that had been commercialized previously again. Um, this more stable form had less bioavailability, was less effective for, for patients. It was not possible to administer it in the same way. Um, and so this led to interruption of supplies. Estimates go that uh, this cost several hundred millions of, of dollars as well. Uh, but most importantly, it was one of the early HIV drugs and patients were left without access to that drug. And so um, Dr. Sun, who worked for Abbott Laboratories at the time, uh, mentioned, likened the appearance of, of a new polymorph to uh, a hur hurricane, something that is disastrous and unpredictable. Fortunately, since 1998, the field has made a bit of progress, and we can now predict, uh, to some extent, the, um, the forms of that organic molecules can make. And in particular, we're interested in co-crystalline forms as a way to avoid what happened in the case of return of air. Um, so adding a component to the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient uh, in order to uh, control the properties of that system and control the bioavailability. So this is a, a powerful technique, but the question is how can one choose a co-former? How can we decide what to add to the active pharmaceutical ingredient? 
And so we set out to develop a methodology to tackle this problem. So this is a product design methodology. Currently, this is done very much by um, experimental screening. The problem with experimental screening is it's very time consuming, but also as in the case of Ritonavir, uh, things might appear to be stable and, and not be quite so stable, or one might miss um, a particular part, uh, form through the experiment. So it takes a lot of work to confirm whether a form might exist or not experimentally. So given an active pharmaceutical ingredient and a set of potential co-formers, such as the one shown here, which are uh, part of an FDA list, we want to determine which co-formers are likely to lead to thermodynamically stable co-crystals so that we can actually do experiments on those and limit the experimental effort. <clears throat> so we want to complement this experimental effort with computational crystal structure prediction. The problem with this approach is that crystal structure prediction, or CSP for short, is itself very time consuming and expensive. It's not unusual for us to spend 200 to 300,000 CPU hours doing such a calculation. And that's just for one particular crystal, perhaps a pure, a pure form of uh, not a crystal, one molecule. So the pure form of carbamazepine that you see here. So are we going to do this for all of the combinations of API and co-former? How can we make this more efficient? So before I can explain how we do this, I want to show you the methodology that we've developed. This is work that was started by Costas um, Pantelidis. So nice to be collaborating with, with my husband. Um, so he started that work with Panos Karamezanis um, with the sponsorship of Mitsubishi Chemical, actually, so many, many years ago. Um, and then we've been continuing this on uh, over the last few years. Uh, so we start with a molecular connectivity diagram. This is for the Roy molecule, by the way, which is uh, the, the molecule that has the most known uh, polymorphs. So very high propensity to create different crystals. And you can see clearly how different um, the properties of the different crystals are. We do some quantum mechanical calculations on this molecule um, with, as a function of conformation. So we rotate the torsion angles here. And we obtain the intramolecular energy and the charge density for those different conformations. It's really important to work at the quantum mechanical level here. Um, because the molecules are packed very closely together, and that's the only way that we can get an accurate representation of their interactions within the crystalline environment. What we do with the data that we generate from these quantum mechanical calculations are quite expensive, is we develop some tailored intramolecular and electrostatic potentials. These are some elements of the lattice energy. So going the wrong way. Um, the other element of the lattice energy is the repulsion dispersion interaction. And for this, we use empir an empirical equation with transferable parameters that have been generated from many, many crystals. We input this model into an algorithm we've called crystal predictor, which does a global search for low energy structure. It's a um, multi-level single leap cage kind of global search, but trying out typically at least uh, half a million structures, usually up to 2 million structures. We then take the lowest energy structures here and we put them through a new, another algorithm called Crystal Optimizer, where we have a much more accurate model of the, uh, of the energy, the lattice energy, so, but also much more expensive. And with that, we then have a landscape which tells us what are the low energy uh, crystals and therefore what uh, polymorphs we predict might exist. So this methodology is something that we've applied to a very large number of systems. And uh, it works for neat API forms. Um, it also works for um, salts, for solvates and hydrates, and importantly import import for co-crystals. Even though we might be working with systems that contain more than one molecule, we always do our quantum mechanical calculations on isolated molecules. And then we put them together in a crystal um, at this level here through our, the force fields that we fitted to this quantum mechanical data. And that's going to be very important for the success of our approach. So let me just tell you a little bit more about how we build those, um, those models of the lattice energy from the quantum mechanical data. So we've done our isolated molecule calculations as a function of the torsion angles. 
this is far too expensive to do within the optimization, within the global optimization. So we do it a priori, on, or we do lots of uh, quantum mechanical calculations, and then we uh, interpolate between the points that we have through local approximate models. These are models that are explicit functions of the torsion angles. They give us the intramolecular energy. They also give us the optimal value of all of the other atomic positions, if you like. So essentially the bond angles and the bond lengths in the molecule. Okay, so they uh, help us to, uh, they replace the solution of the quantum mechanical equations, not only for the energy evaluations, but also for the geometry evaluation. And that's really important. The local approximations, the more points we add, the more accurate we can make them. So we can always make them more accurate in any given area of space. And we use those at both stages of a CSP search. In the global search, through an a priori database uh, of points that we've selected and we've placed in an adaptive fashion um, through, the, through the space of possibilities. And then in the refinement stage, we construct them on the fly to increase the accuracy in areas that seem the most interesting from the point of view of finding a minimum energy um, configuration. So something that we've been developing for many years and we've been accelerating uh, in terms of making them run faster and more accurately as time has proceeded. And this is the basis uh, for our approach to selecting coformers. Because the QM calculations are the major cost element in the CSP. But the fact that they're for the isolated molecule means that these lambs, these local approximate models, depend only on the molecule that we have and the QM level of theory. But we can then take that one molecule and put it next to other molecules for which we also have lambs without having to recompute the lambs ever again. And so for the coformers, which we're going to try with different APIs, we can do the calculations once and for all. We can take the grass list from the FDA and do all these calculations. And then we can use the databases, our pre-done quantum mechanical calculations to screen with any API. So the methodology is we do this calculation for all the grass list coformers. So today I'll use 10 of them shown here. And we create the LAM databases for this. We do the same thing for a given API. So we uh, do a CSP search, we get the energy, we also get our lambs. And then for each performer, we now combine the API and the performer and we do a CSP search, but we now have to do very few quantum mechanical calculations. And then we're going to use a metric to assess whether this performer is likely to be stable. We're going to look at delta delta U which is the energy of the combined uh, crystal, the co-crystal API plus C, we take the lowest energy one, minus the energy of the API by itself, the, most, the lowest energy one, and the lowest structure for the coformer. We know from the literature and from experimental data that typically if you observe a coformer, oh sorry, co-crystal, it means that the delta delta U doesn't exist, uh, exceed 10 kilojoules per mole. So we're going to generate a landscape like this. This is the lattice energy, the density. Each dot is a potential structure for a co-crystal, so for a given API plus coformer combination. And we're going to look at the difference between um, the isolated, or the, so the pure crystals and the co-crystal. And if it, that is within five kilojoules per mole, we're going to say that it is likely that the co-crystal could form. Of course, if this is below uh, the, the two separate energies, then it is also likely that this would form. Okay, so just to show you how this, this works. Um, so these are the three APIs we've looked at and the potential conformers I've listed before. Um, and here are the results. So we have worked with um, Doris Brown at Innsbruck who has done some really extensive experiments for us. So she's used three different techniques to try and crystallize each pair of co-crystal, um, so API and co-former. So that's a lot of experiments that she's carried out. And if you look um, at aspirin, what she found is that aspirin doesn't easily form, form co-crystals. In fact, she didn't find any. Um, if we use our five kilojoule per mole cutoff, we would recommend two experiments and not, neither of these experiments would 
give us a co-crystal and so we could conclude that aspirin does not form co-crystals. On the other hand, carbamazepine very easily makes co-crystals and so she's found quite a few and we would recommend carrying out experiments with all co-formers. And finally for paracetamol, which is in between those two, we would recommend six experiments and she found that two of those would result in the co-crystal. So if you look at this overall, if you do the experiments that are recommended by the computational approach, you would have to do 40% fewer experiments than what uh, Doris did in her work to identify all of the co-crystals that, that exist. In addition, because of our reuse of the QM calculations and the LAM databases, each API co-former CSP is at least twice faster than doing a pure API CSP. So it's much, much faster to be able, when we are able to reuse these calculations, even though it should be more expensive to do a calculation for a crystal that contains two molecules. Normally this would, uh, this would be extremely expensive if we didn't have those databases. And what we learned through this as well is that there's a balance between the transferability of a potential and the bespoke nature of the potential. So in particular, the assumption that we've made, which from a computational chemistry or physical chemistry perspective, you might frown out that we can use isolated molecular calculations to predict what might happen in the crystalline environment. This is a very rough approximation, but it is essential to enable product design. So I've given you three areas of work. There's a lot that I haven't talked about. In particular, I haven't talked about all the work that we've been doing on solvent design for crystallization uh, and for reactions, which has been very exciting work, looking at things process-wise or um, also integrating quantum mechanical calculations of rate constants within the design envelope. But that will be for another time. I think hopefully what I've shown you looking back is that there are some significant benefits to expanding the envelope of process design. That PSC tools and thinking have an important role to play in advancing property prediction techniques that can be used for our purpose of product and process design. And so in, in my view, engagement with thermodynamics and prediction methods is really essential. And um, I'm sure a lot of you will, will agree that continuing the development of optimization methods both theory and algorithms is required for product and process design and of course for many other applications. Just briefly looking ahead, um, if we want to look at the much broader picture of sustainability, I believe that it is really important to expand that envelope further to, um, in, in product design in particular, to go away from molecular structure to physical property, material performance, the manufacture of the molecules and the function. And we need that whole chain to work in order to be able to, to assess things like sustainability. We really need to bring product discovery and manufacturing together. That's a very ambitious thing to do, so there's plenty of work to be done in this area. Um, I think in terms of um, developing structural property performance prediction techniques, but also in terms of adapting the models we have that are transferable, the group contribution models, to the particular application with fast parameter estimation and large databases is something that should become doable. We need more high quality data, both computational and experimental. And I think there's a great opportunity to engage with people who are working on, for example, high throughput experiments and to uh, use that, those platforms in order to develop hybrid computational and experimental platforms. Um, and a lot of work to be done on solving the design problems with surrogate models. Um, and also taking uncertainty into account, which is something I haven't really discussed today. And I want to end with some thank yous. Um, so to the CAST community, all of you here today, but just over the years, um, it's been a great community to be part of. The Sargent Center has also been um, a really inspiring place to work, both uh, for people who are there, um, academics and students and postdocs, but also all the people who come and visit us. And I hope you can all come and visit us very soon again many collaborators, colleagues, and, and sponsors. And it's especially a pleasure to be um, sharing an award year with uh, Sal, who is a really worthy recipient of the Computing Practice Award. It was only a matter of time for him to, to receive it. And I'm really happy um, that he's received the same year as I've had this award. We have a great collaboration going. 
many, many collaborators and, and, and sponsors I'm really thankful to. Most importantly, um, my group. So here, there are too many names to put on the slide, but here are a few snapshots over the year of the group. Um, and you can see a, a recent, more recent photo here, unfortunately, uh, but so we hope to have uh, many photos to show in the future where we can all get together. Uh, and finally, I also want to thank uh, my family. So my, uh, <clears throat> my parents who have been very supportive and uh, let me pursue some crazy dreams like uh, moving to London by myself when I was only 16. So I'm really grateful that they encouraged me to, to do this. Um, my, my late brother uh, who had a fantastic sense of humor and is really missed. Um, my sister who is really a wonder woman and uh, a wonderful person. And um, of course, um, Costas, who is my partner in crime for many things and uh, um, both uh, great support and inspiration and great fun as well. Um, Costas is all the children, Kat and Alex, who have welcomed me and also um, opened a lot of new horizons for me. I'm really grateful to them. And uh, Mark and Cleo, who uh, keep me uh, grounded and uh, always remind me that I might be a professor, but there are many things that, that I don't know and I, I still have to learn. So thank you very much for your attention and for the award. I'm really grateful uh, for this and really humbled and I hope to see you all soon, very soon. Great, well, thank you very much, Claire, for your talk. It was, it was a great talk and um, congratulations again on the award um, and uh, congratulations to all the other winners as well. And uh, I think I think with that we're gonna wrap up for the day. So. Congratulations. Yeah, so all right. So everybody take care. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.